sketching the graph of this rational function. Now there's quite a bundle of stuff going on here, but at least it's been factorised to begin with. Well, just normal procedure. So, where does it cut the y-axis? Cuts the y-axis when x is 0, and if x is 0, that means y is going to be negative 3 times 6 over negative 1 times 2. So y is going to be, that's positive 9. So it's cutting at 0, 9. <coughs> x-axis. That means y is going to be 0. That's sufficient for the numerator to be 0. Which means either x equals, put them in order, negative 6, or x equals 3. So I've got the points negative 6, 0, and 3, 0. <coughs> and then last, no, not lastly, and then next, what about the vertical asymptotes? That means the denominator. Does that ever equal 0? Indeed it does. At negative 2 and at 1. <coughs> now, rather than... I'll just mark this all off. I've got all this information so far. Rather than go through these individually from this, there's something that could be done quite usefully when you've got a bundle of factors, and that is make up a table of signs to see th when things are negative and positive throughout all the differences <coughs> that you have in those four numbers. So putting down a table of signs, mm, I've not left myself a lot of room, I'll put it in here very small. Because what happens is this, something happens at negative 6, something happens at negative 2, something happens at 1, and something happens at 3, where things can switch back and forth between positives and negatives. And the factors that will make up the value of y are these four factors. Now I'm not interested in which, can, which are multiplying and which are dividing, only that they're all factors. So that, irrespective of the multiplier and dividing, if it's only the sign of the answer I want, then simply multiplying those signs together will give me the final value of y. So this is actually going to be quite useful. This will tell me, for all these different regions in the domain, whether the graph's going to be above the x-axis or below the x-axis. Now, instead of splitting into all these parts, I'm just going to draw a line down from negative 6. <coughs> Meaning, at negative 6, something happens. At negative 2, a switch occurs. And at 1, a switch occurs. Same with 3, some switch occurs. Well, at 3, it's a top number. The answer will be 0. Negative 6, since it's a top number, the answer will be 0. But at the bottom, when it's 1, it's going to be not defined, but I just like to write infinity there. And the same with negative 2. If we've got a negative 2 for x, that bottom number is 0, so the answer's not defined, it's gone off the scale. <coughs> I'm just going to put infinity. Then all I've got to do is consider what happens before and between and after these numbers. And I get that from the factors. It was 0 at 3. What happens if x is a number less than 3? That factor will be negative. And then after 3, it goes positive. Same with this. At negative 6, it's 0. Before it, it's negative. After it, it's positive. At 1, it would be 0. Before it, it would be negative. After it, it would be positive. And at negative 2, 0. Before it's negative. After it's positive. And then just multiplying those four together. It doesn't actually match up the multiply and dividing. Multiplying those four together to get the sign of the answer. If there was four negative factors, that's a positive. That's a negative because it's an odd one. Back to positive, negative, positive. That actually gives you a picture of where the graph is. It's crossing at negative 6 from below to above. It's crossing at 3. It's a 0 from a below, to, below to above. And these are going to be the two asymptotes. And you can see the signs on either side of them. This says on one side it's negative, so it must be popping down. The other side it's positive, so it must be going up. On this side it's positive, it must be going up. And the sign that's ne side is negative. That's quite handy then. <coughs> Making up this table of signs when you've got a factorised expression like that to see exactly what's happening with the graph. And that's quite a lot actually. You could probably reconstruct most of the graph from that. So that's my vertical asymptote. Now I want my non-vertical asymptote. Well for that, I know that it's going to be just a number. 
like 1 or 2 or 0. And since the term in top starts x squared and the bottom one says x squared, and they're both the same, it's the asymptote's going to be y equals 1. If the top had had 2x squared and the bottom just x squared, it would have been 2. If it had been 2x squared, 3x squared, it would have been 2 thirds and so on. But I need to see how it approaches it and so on, so I think I'll just carry out a division there, which means I'm going to have to multiply that out. I'll put it over here. So that function would read x squared plus 3x minus 18, x squared plus just x minus 2. And I could split that into 1. That would use up the x squared and one of the x's. So I've still got 2x and a negative 2. So I've still got a negative 16 over x squared plus x minus 2. And then how does it approach it? Well, so before that, so what is this non-vertical asymptote? Well, as x tends to infinity, that means y is going to tend to, well, this part here is going to come to 0. It's going to tend to 1. You know that part's going to come to 0 by doing divide by x squared. I'd have 2 over x minus 16 over x squared over 1 plus 1 over x minus 2 over x squared. If x was infinity, all those fractions would go to 0, just leave me a 0 over 1, which is just 0. So that's just going to go to 1. How does it approach that 1? Well, as x tends to negative infinity, that means y would go to 1, and then that would be... The bottom is going to be positive, its dominant term is x squared, so it doesn't matter what sign it's got, but the top would be negative, so it's going to be minus a bit. As x goes to positive infinity, what's going to happen to y? Well, it's going to approach 1, and if they're all positive, it's going to be plus a bit. So this part of this line would be this. I've got the line y equals 1, and as I go to negative infinity, I'm going to be coming up from below, because the value will be 1 less a bit, getting less and less of less of a bit. And as I go to positive infinity, it's going to be 1 plus a bit. I'm going to be starting higher, and that amount there, a little epsilon, will be getting lower. So that's that approach. Okay, I've got my points of intersection on the axis. I've got my asymptotes. I've got how they approach the asymptotes. I should put it over here. Non-vertical asymptote then is y equals 1. Now that just leaves the nasty bit. Well, there was quite a lot of information in that table of signs there, which is the derivative. Oh, so I've got to either differentiate this or differentiate that. It's probably easier to differentiate that one. Right, so dy by dx is going to be, if I differentiate that one, that disappears, so I've just got the quotient rule. So x squared plus x minus 2 will be squared. That's handy because that's always positive, so I can ignore it when I'm thinking of signs. Top, derivative 2, leave the bottom one alone. Minus top, leave it alone this time, now differentiate the bottom, 2x plus 1. So that's a real pest. Oh, here we go. Sometimes you're tempted just to write d at the bottom because that's no longer of any significance. Yeah, I've got 2x squared plus 2x minus 4 minus, now I've got to multiply this out, 4x squared and I've got minus 32 plus 2 is minus 30x, minus 16. Tidy it up again. I'm going to need more room again somewhere after this to start working this lot out. You're going to have to go. So I've got minus 2x squared plus 32x, and that's plus 16 minus 12 plus 12 for the derivative. So stationary points means dy by dx should equal 0, <coughs> and that means this top part should equal 0 which means negative 2x squared plus 32x plus 12 should equal 0. Just take out that negative 2. I'm going to have to keep that negative 2 because I'll want it later for the signs. Because one thing I don't want to do is differentiate this again. I'm not going to find the second derivative doing this. If I've got a justifier point, I'm just going to see what happened before, what happened after with the table of signs. Or just a nature table if there's no signs available. So that's going to be x squared, taking a negative 2, so it'll be minus 16x minus 6 equals 0. Straight away you can see that's not going to work. I'm not going to get factors of 6 that make a 16 when you add them. So it's the formula. Oh. So it's going to have to be x equals, square that, sorry, positive of that, plus or minus, the square of that, 256 plus 24, which is going to give me 280 
over 2 times a, which is 2. And it's just a case of put that into your calculator to get your two answers. So negative, just round it off, negative 0 0.37, or now the positive one, 16.37. Now I've got to work out y, maybe we should put y equals, x equals I mean, I've got to work out y, putting it into this form here, and that gives me rounding it off 8.50, same for this one, y is going to be, so, and that gives me 1.06. So there's the two stationary points, negative 0 0.37, 8.50, and 16.37, 1.06. But if I have to justify these, I'm not going to differentiate that again. I'm just going to use a table of signs. There's the derivatives. I just want to know what was the sign before and after each of those. I'll make a little table up here. Something happened at negative 0.3 something. And something happened at 16.37. But I make sure I stay close to them. I can use anything convenient. So I could use 0 and I could use negative 1. Eh, 10 safe, isn't it? It's well beyond anything. Any precipice. I could use 10 and I could use 20, for instance. I could use those values either side of them. I know it's going to be 0 there and 0 there. That's x. What's divided by dx? So it's just a case of putting these numbers into that and seeing what sign I get. <coughs> could probably work it out without a calculator fairly easily because I can see that negative one, that's the dominant term, so that at the bottom doesn't matter because it's positive, so I'll just agree with MD, we'll just sit in the fence. So I've got a positive 16, they can't interfere with that, so that's negative overall. At zero, that's even better, that just means I've got a negative six, so I've got a negative times a negative, so that's positive. So here, I've got a minimum. So I've got a minimum at this point. Now what happens at this one? 10. Now 10's still not going to dominate because 10 tens don't match 16 tens. So that's going to be a negative. That won't be able to affect it. Times a negative is a positive. By 20 though, that'll overwhelm the rest. So that's going to be a positive. Times a negative, that'll be a negative. So that means it's going like this. So here I'm going to have a maximum. Finally, I've got all the information I need. I'll keep that little table there just to check my ups and downs as well. Right, let's clear some space for the graph. So, oh, ready for the graph. Here's all the information put over here. Where does it cut the axis? Where's the turning points? The asymptotes, vertical, non-vertical, and that information is still on the table about when it's above and when it's below. Put it all together. Crosses at 9. I'll call that 9. Crosses at negative 6. I'll put that there. Crosses at 3. Those are the zeros. It's got a turning point at just a little bit and a little bit below that. At negative a bit here. So I'll just put that there. I'll put these lines in first of all. I've got a horizontal asymptote. Y equals 1. I've got a vertical asymptote at 1. So that's back here. Vertical asymptote at 1. I've got another one at negative 2. Two, so I'll put that here. That messed up that turning point now. Deary me. Another one at negative two. I've got turning this turning point here. I've got another turning point at 16, way over here, and just a touch above the line. 16.37, 1.06. Right, let's start sneaking it all through. It should approach from below, still positive though. It should cross through here, and it should approach negative two which is here. That bit's fair enough. So it's going to come along through there and down there. So that's that part. That was meant to be an asymptote there. That's that part sorted. On this side of that vertical asymptote, it should be coming down to this minimum and going back up again. And on its way back up, we'll cross that. So that's fair enough. It comes down, crosses and goes back up. A little bit wobbly, but there we are. On the other side of that, it's coming up from below though. It's coming up from below so it can cross that. But it's got to approach this one from above. But that's fair enough, because what it'll do is this. It'll come up. It'll take a turn there, and then start twisting back down again. We have to readjust my number somewhere, because I've put the top about here. 
crossing there. That's a picture of it, apart from having put in this point here, which was negative 0 0.37, 8.50. That would be the graph that meets all the criteria. And the same here, positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive again. That's a picture of the graph.